Beat Poetry Foundation is celebrating with its Beat Laureates the whole month of April. And it's National Poetry Month, a celebration of poetry which takes place each April. And it was introduced in 1996 and is organized by the Academy of American Poets as a way to increase awareness and appreciation of poetry in the United States. Hi, everyone. And I'm going to be introducing you to our first laureate reading. She is Lori DeRochers. She was the US National Beat Poet Laureate from 2016 to 2017. And she's from Massachusetts. Hi, Lori. Hi, Debbie, how are you? <laughs> Good. Okay, so I'm going to read a few uh, poems from uh, my latest book, which is called Keeping Planes in the Air from Salmon Poetry. And, um, and then I'm going to read you a, a new piece um, about the body. How the house we carry with us changes what it feels like to see the face age, how the breasts fall, how pain becomes a given, how the skin was once unblemished and smooth like the curve of earth or sunbeams bent by trees. It is also about caves, the one we dig to hide secrets, a wish to get beyond mirrors, how my mother is shrinking, she says she'll end up a puddle in the kitchen no one will recognize. This poem is about emerging, about finding beauty in imperfection, how skin stretches to accommodate bones, their restless march toward death. I haven't read this one much. It's called Stepped into the Music Store and Fell in Love. Rosin and horsehair, dark wood flecked black from years of use. A cigarette burned, ashes dropped. He must have smoked while playing, the old man who played this violin. I hear Hungarian dances, not fiddle, bowing almost effortless. My body knows without having to think, toned better than my student violin a German Stradivarius copy, well-loved but not coddled. Fingers on my left hand reach for notes. My music comes back to me. This is called Dad's Sense, as in S-T-E-N-T-S. My dad smelled like Old Spice and old books. Spinoza, Keats, Jung, and Shakespeare, typewriter ribbon, head and shoulders, vinyl dust on Beethoven records, played on high volume for his one deaf ear, white starch shirts from the cleaners, shaving cream and witch hazel, Nivea lotion and crest, gold bond powder and talc, leather shoes and jacket creams to grow hair on his bald spot, yellow dog fur, parsley and lemons, red wine, sometimes gin, tonic and limes, reel-to-reel -reel tape, cherry pipe tobacco, Subaru seats, occasional marijuana, his second wife's perfume, fountain pen ink, chalk and student papers, pigeons on sills, car exhaust as he pulled away, the phone receiver when we talked, alcohol and liniment, chemo and radiation, too little, too late, Christmas pine, our last time together, incense and the sweet smell of dirt. I want to end with this. 
I'm going to, I'm going to read the new thing and then two other pieces from the book. So I'm writing a series of prose poems uh, right now, tentatively entitled, uh, titled Pandemic Spring or Second Pandemic Spring and uh, having fun with this. So I'm reading you um, April 5th. It's for 3030 challenge. In the second to the cemetery to visit mom's grave, or should I say the garden where we scattered her ashes? There's a stone with her name on it, along with several other names, people I don't know. I brought with me a heart-shaped piece of quartz I found in Falmouth on Martha's Vineyard Sound and put it on the top next to the ones from last year and the year before. Yearly commemorations, now there are three. There's a nice rock to sit on by where her ashes are scattered. So I sat and talked to her a bit or to the universe, who knows, but we had a nice chat. Sometimes I say something and can hear her voice in the back of my head answering me. She was 94 when she died and her voice was in my head long before that saying, Lori, you know that's not true or you're strong, just push through this. The buds on the trees are almost in bloom. There's a blossoming plum tree above the spot where we put her ashes, whose roots almost touch the place where she is. So this is her tree. That was beautiful, Lori. I have two more. Is that all right? Do you have time? Yes, now? go ahead. Okay. This is called Praise to the Earth. And um, I was having fun with it. It's sort of for children's poem, but or for children, but it might not be. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's in the book, so. Praise to the ocean, waves and foam, bright reef fish hiding in anemone, sharks and whales doze below, Above them cormorants and gannets float. To waves that roll into shore at night, the moon reflecting sea foams white, the breakers in sync with our breathing as the buoy bell sings in the harbor. Praise to tiny creatures, amoeba and molds, bacteria, to the algae sisters, chloro, pheo, and rhodophyra, green and blue, green lichen, moss, and plankton. Praise to nanobes and eukaryotes. Praise to beach roses, pink under streetlights, to peonies, iris, and lilac. Even at midnight, inhale the scent. To the bees safe in their hive. To evening clouds, white moon behind them, summer rain watering the gardens. Praise to writers and scribblers, fruit in the bowl, mat on the table, water in the mug, to the record on the turntable, the hat on the hat stand, the coat on the chair. Praise to new parents walking a baby, to the restless soldier home from war. Praise to the peacemakers, to poets, listeners to the night noises, cicadas, clapping of wings, to snorers and dreamers, singers in their sleep. Praise to the earth, our home. I think I'll end on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Very beautiful. Next, we have Banked Bjorklund. He's our lifetime beat poet laureate from Sweden. And his um, lifetime award was given in 2018. Hi, Bing. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> oh, I miss the live version of this party. <laughs> Stark to the naked bone of a pale wintry sky, filled with the silent hope of snow and icy hearts falling through the air, I bend my old knees and pull an old tarp over the old stage with its leaky roof. 
January is concluding us. Parky meters are no longer in use. From afar, a woodpecker pecks in a moor's kind of way. The wind creeps like a patient in a silent cancer ward. Someone bursts into a bottle just for the sake of being alive on a Sunday afternoon. Seemingly out of touch with dark weather and fools, Rarity moved its long legs just to get a glimpse of the continuity. I saw him as I drew my car through January blizzard, taxing all my abilities just to stay in the middle of the road. There was jazz on the radio. Rampant leaders vain the people, struggling constantly in twilight. Rulers in need of more stretchers run for the sake of more say-so beneath a bleeding sky. Daredevil you in pajamas, soliciting zebra crossings, taking no prisoners, wielding swords of no return, you will not survive. Boats checking out at midnight, terminal fatally wounded, trains losing control and tracks. Where are we now? There's no verbal tide to trust. There is an urgency rolling eye down steep hills of old, where I in sadness fold all days gone and cry. Stirred by whispers and a song, that I reloaded bourbon and a hard snow on the run, I leave my shadow long. Stellar is my regard, anonymity my way. There will be a final day when easy will be hard. Spinning tales of wild winter roll dreams of schooners down steep hills where I still sleep with a sharp grip on my sanity wandering. Stable boys and milkmaids burn like dry olive wood in a fireplace meant for peace. Smoke I am and an echo of more falling snow. Driven into sidebar where tankers rise and fall to the sound of the crackling, I will cry for the shortness of the day that we are. Danced into a pigeon's nest, I finally tumble and fall. There is no reason why. The body is aged and ready, decaying with the rest. Spinning tales of wild winter, rule dreams of scorners down steep hills for I still sleep with sharp grip on my sanity wandering. There was a sudden silence, a new kind of bubbling, a stirring, a longing. Night flew in with solitary birds returning from war-stricken lands. The moon is not a lamp, the weather does not respond to human abuse. The sky is a crypt, a death, dogs snarl at he who dares to go to war. The moon sees you long before you see the pulling of the trigger. In a sudden silence roams all the loss one man can muster. Dread plummets like falling flakes or thorns. In the aftermath, no one is safe. I gather all songs withered on the frozen field where I once was more than the last ticking on a doomed market. market. I sit by the door. Love is not just a silly word. Summoned like a summer's rain, or found in a cup of warm breast milk. Its music will change your world as days continue to roll before you are gone. Staring blind tomorrow into oblivion, I let black letters sink into tea leaves of an unread future where medallions will not shine. The time always will run out while well, this band is still playing. Sutured with a blunt needle, roamed and put asleep in beds where long torment rings like desperate boys in a sudden storm. Repossessed and alone, dread fed by clouds full of dark opinion, stuffed with despair and storms of agony. I will still be here with the ash of tomorrow and the landscapes march down to the bone.
I will be the lost heir. Stubborn in yet another spring, refusing the blaring light, old man sheds his darkness in the silence of his garden, gravel raked in waves before an old temple shuddering. Leafless trees are calligraphy against an ice blue sky. Old man warm to his life, listen to the billowing void. No cold wind of spring can restart his days. Tie me another day. In so many different fashions, one or I will not care. How it all started, no one will remember. A dead cable show. Scattered in the shadows of meager expectancy, one falls even deeper into old songs and myths, billowing into submission one more time. Seemingly out of phase, kind of evaporated, lost man in charge finds himself in a bind, driving dead men to work long before the time. Strands of humility moves in the slow wind. The ambulance rushes through the traffic. The blue lights turning weather into polar bears in open water. Notice the shift of colors as I turn into you, as it will be all any man or woman can realize with any emotion rolling air into wooden caskets. I read the sky today, bricks and mortar ready for the big leap. Once there was a bird chirping at the kitchen knife, turning sun into water. Reflections bother me, tiled into an uneasy comfort above the charcoal trees. Tidal conclusions fly, ceremonial testimonies rake the circular circus floor. Every Sunday, there are eye flowers in the machine, ghosts turning into echoes. The sky is a metaphor. Solemn is a word, bad trees relate to. Volatility is a condition beyond time. There is a new darkness, wrapped in yet more darkness, swirling around your bare ankles like insects suddenly born this cold winter's day. The question of ownership runs like a raw rash across a world preparing to march again. Years later, dead soldiers could be seen at the bottom of cold winter lakes. Fools still danced on the tilting glass floor, waiting for an anchor. The last one. Soldiers in long lines wait for the command, leading them into dark body mayhem. Children with big eyes are like trees that will only smile when treated with generosity. The cold war of the species rages from daybreak to more days than an eye can fathom. Winter is coming, while speakers ruminate in fountains of fake news, there is hell to pay. I am the dog you never considered, the invitation you buried in ire. Thank you. Thank you, Bing. I hope I kept my time limit. <laughs> Next up, I'm not sure I can pronounce your last name, Gabor. I have to unmute. Sorry. Oh. Uh, Gabor. Like Jukic. Jukic. Lukic. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Any way you pronounce it, it's perfect. <laughs> he is also a lifetime Beat Poet Laureate. He's from Hungary and he got his lifetime award in 2020. Uh, hi, good boy. <laughs> hey, Gabby. Hi, everyone. I might need this, these glasses here. Okay. Uh, in Hungary, we don't have uh, poetry month, but we have a poetry day, which is tomorrow, April 11, because that was the day when Attila Joseph 
one of our greatest poets was born. So we'll celebrate that day tomorrow. Okay, um, uh, my first poem is The Messenger. The bird messenger appearing for no reason is unthinkable as it was followed by verdurous patches on trees and bushes. What is this if not possible pieces of our madness? which appear as non-competitive life details by emanating out of men, like most everything which creaked inside us during winter and gives us serious strength to continue. That's why we are able to chop iron with iron, piece after piece. This is what helping us recognize death as acknowledgement of life. This is what throws us up without betting an eye and starts the frozen engine. The ventriloquist. The inhabitants of this globe move over anything unworthy, which would not change their daily routine, but will make them fall head first in any manhole that won't ever regurgitate, regurgitate them. In vain they prone with unrelenting mind or goggle at the particular absence of staggering objects, which would likely pull them up. Though there is no need for ambitious plans, nor for fractured sentences on a mobile podium stage by these disposable creatures who are nothing else but artful dodgers, for neither their ventricle nor their hearing and vision are omnipotent. Hogging a robot. You cut down the foliage around the hanging garden. Yet it wasn't you who sent me the flowers, but someone else who might be able to love. All you need is the scent of my skin, the openings of my body. You walk around me sniffing like dogs around the bushes. You're covertly watching me, hearkening in disguise, mumbling your observations into your digital recording device, listening to it sound by sound during your coffee break. Later, you bump into me by the revolving door. The dust, stirred by our momentary touch, flies away like an invisible, invisible entity you wish to possess. You touch me slightly in the elevator that stopped a second ago. You stroke me the way blind people read Braille. I crumple myself up, won't let you read me. Under the ruins of the elevator, you're housing my whole body. Ruining the temporal. As if hundred years ago and still indigenous simplicity is free from longing. We swim underwater by the subway from Pesht to Buddha. We rest in the hiding place of reeds on the shore. An osprey is orbiting above us, speaking with his wings. From under our feet, a grass snake glides into the sage mesh. Invisible frogs are watching. Dragonflies zip by. You don't feel the ardent desire for anything. The shapes of beauty swayed by the breeze. No pushing, no boasting. Our eyes don't flutter in material deficiency. Enlightenment is such a rare moment, like the place and the date on the back of a photograph. In vain I'm staring. Familiar faces though, but still they aren't. Could it be the zoo? Before a donkey pulled cart by an artificial lake, a boy who might be me standing with a nice woman. Is she my grandmother? I'm standing on the edge of the tracks. The last train has gone. Dogs bark behind closed fences. Two girlfriends from the past became, become an unexpected, unexpected thought. The names are mysteries, but I see their faces. Do they remember me or I no longer exist? I don't believe in time. Let it be past, future, present. I watch Spanish thrillers at night. These Southern Europeans can be just as filthy, pervert, cold creatures like us Hungarians, 
based on our politics, or Scandinavia's based on the novels. The sky is white. The green of the trees is woodpecker pecking at my stomach. My face between two tufts of grass, holding my very last breaths. Hidden joy. An unstrained person chopping wood after wood to pieces in the swirling heat wave, shaved by a shrinking sun, dialing for the moon to talk her into swapping the day for night. Wanting to set by gliding down a lake next to a riparian marsh among white warblers or sprays where the mantis is scarce, grievously for the gliding, he who is incorporated under a luminescent circle, close blind, as close to a sublime coastline to cheer up the elusive wood chopper, he who is building a raft at the behest of a swashbuckling superior he hates, so he'll hide the leak he secretly bilged for everyone's pleasure. Creating your own music. The early troglodytes might have despised the shimbling of birds, especially the cawing of crows to beguile the tedium of watching a blunt pointed angle. They chopped, they chopped wood after wood to pieces, chased thousands of mantis and cockroaches from the greens of their caves, tried avoiding to hear the footfall of ghosts by entering someone else's thoughts, parted the meadow covered with fiddlehead ferns, the surface of the long built path across the hills, which was shaped by roots of every tree they had known around the crevices of earth, emitting particles of previously inhaled fog of density. When the thunder slept, they decorated long narrow sticks with tails heard from wild horses, carved violins out of split wood, glued the pieces together with resin, used the intestines of a fallen, once hungry wolf for strings, lifted all to their shoulders and began to play. A love poem, all my love poems are about parting. At the airport, you had no tears, but glue the half smile on your face kept yourself busy with this and that, stared at my suitcase where you found nothing else around to touch but me. This yellow raglan sleeve coat looks good on you, I said, instead of saying, I'll be back. You took off your coat and put it in your bag. I deserved it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Right. So. so next next up, we have Amelia Mattis. She's the State of Wisconsin Beat Poet Laureate, 2020 to 2022. Welcome, Amelia. All right, thank you, hello. This is um, a journey piece, and um, it is a lovely a myth that I, I do believe in because it, it came from source, and the next chapter is ready to be born. So I am going to put this out in the universe so that can be gifted back by Gaia. It is called Ishmatar and Israel. It was published in my book of all the trees and gods originally. The giraffe next to the stone and mud structure lifted neck slowly. It was heavy to lift, not the neck, but the head. Small, though heavy as low slung milk breast, filled with dreams and maps, fortune tellers, the tons of cave dwellers clicking and stick dragging into clay walls that became along with flies and spoke. Portraits with no Mona and no Lisa, 
instead figures to build entire museums around. Very capable, the giraffe, postured well with extended eyelash, blinking daylight in, not out, and deep brown eyes mostly thought about with just the trees, the sacred grove, tall enough to gaze into those liquid-filled history books. Inside the room was Ishmatar, her long, lean body stretched out on bed naked but for the mosquito net, and Israel's muscled arm strung over her navel. Heart and embrace, the bit a grip locking Ishmatar from rolling out of bed, a bunch of African violets strewn and galloping out of structure. She, a black wild horse, hooves sand of rising, blinding Israel, tiger then, chasing and slowed by rocks kicked up. Though for now still in his grip, he was working on not looking full into her face. That would be enough to weaken him. More than an army of red ants, as people misunderstand fire. More than the poisoned arrow for Ishmatar's beauty rivaled the sun. So many village men in stubborn youth once dared stare too long. Now they are starstruck moons after sideways squinting when other rare jewels with naked feet saunter past, crying only Ishmatar, Ishmatar, lone wolves to the moon. While coyotes had cackled and driven noise so full into the night, the day had risen earlier than usual. Flying sun rays that offered relief to rise different star. Israel kissed Ishmatar's shoulder, lips pink against the, as waiting, pray. He was drifting down to her collarbone. How holy her collarbone. The strength that holds entire solar system up. Ishmatar sighed and the purple jeweled rain left her finger, grew wings and glistened as it fluttered out the door. One more butterfly to help the round belly children in the village break into gap tooth smiles. They were arguing, the lovers, as so often did they do, very quietly not with much anger, mostly because Ishmatar felt she must agree often with husband. It would help with intellect and it was named Sin, yet born of origin in her bloodline, while Israel would defend himself being warrior, a village, strong man, not held under woman's spell, no. But of course he would succumb to her impossible not to, how his Ishmatar would flash angry indigo eyes that kept all the wild frightened and she would hold a grudge for days. Lovely Ishmatar, unlike all the white tigers, strong Israel, filled with spirits of wild elephants never taken down for bone. Israel stood ground now, this was important. This time, his wife must take his word. Tis the time, Israel offered boldly then. I am not leaving, his Ismatar cried out, loud enough for anyone and anything miles away to understand. Yes, we are to my orange blur, Israel argued. He stood quick, eyes pressed to horizon. My father has told me so, so we go. Ishmatar sprang and grabbed white sheets, wrapped into dressed, fabric gasped by the pheromone scent of skin. I don't care about the hunting, she spat, bitter taste in mouth. 
or about the money Israel you do you then go Love returned in rebuttal to see wife grabbing empty rice cloth filled it with only his fresh river wash and sun dry clothing into open mouth widening as Israel's jaw set firm tighter than ever before it was uncomfortable for him but needed Israel would turn Atlas to his knees and uproot each tree in the forest by by its leaves if that is, is what it would make to to make sweet love please but th this was an order from his holy father this he could not deny Ishmatar gasped as Israel grabbed her pushed her quick against the wall suddenly there are walls again. Both of the curls on their heads, wet and cursing black ravens, twisted into braid, curling into each other like shiny serpents, forgetting Kundalini. She could have escaped, yet let husband hold her. His, his locked fist around her wrist, clench claw like, though not a vulture. You will obey me this time bellowed Israel. We will return soon, but first. In his fear and assistance to order her, truly the first time and only ever tried, one of his hands had slipped, and Ishmatar pulled back her arm, spun dizzy the earth, not thinking, and quick slap, it landed in perfect place on his cheek. She wished it to serve with many grass nettle stains as two tears fell from strong husband's face. They betrayed his bravado, shared the boldness of his vulnerability, and slipped quick from his black iris and purple eyes. These tears, enough to appeal mercy from Cain's order of a hundred whiplicks, and Ishmatar stepped back looking at husband and wished to white pain with palm but time stood still and she was not allowed to you dare strike me israel whispered his voice was given strength from broken tree limbs you dare order me to obey you brave warrior ishmatar's tongue son weak a dance. A dance around the room then. A room modest, with many open eyes to both the west and the east. No ceiling, just the north star. A bed, a fire, a few stoops of cut tree, and two lovers now around and around. Israel clinging to Ishmatar. She clinging to Israel. No music. But the myth their footprints would draw from storytellers. Dance did they, furious at first, turning to cheetah, snake, rattles, then softer, raspberry, peach flesh, yams and clay when the day is cold. Then Israel carried weeping Ishmatar to comforts of the bed, his eyes widened by her sudden change. What is this? he said. Ishmatar, her brow now straightened to fold, hands no longer weapons, only bearing his arms, took Israel's heavy, sun darkened left and placed it delicate atop her stretched and softened belly. So many moons she had hid. It is this, Ishmatar whispered. Israel's eyes grew wide, his spoons of the red moon singing with the blues. He joyfully bent head and kissed all of Ishmatar brightly. Aha! Aha! he cried, pulling holder of newborn bird out of nest, and they both stomped the dirt floor gleefully in hops that jingled with Ishmatar's ankle bell. Laughter burst out of their lips, spilling rice sack, tumbling over water jug, and startling a wandering peacock to open all feathers until rainbows 
swirled and new colors were created. Oh, just like you, my naughty wife, Israel danced to tell me in this way. He spun her around, and Ishmachar gathered the flowers from her face plan, then blew them playfully her husband's way. I know not when, but soon, Ishmachar smiled, as they both took rest on the soft ground the gods built. Giraffe outside took note from home of east wind, peeked his face to see his master's swoon. They were flying genies, and the stone hot sun all four feet, then lifted closer to the heavens. So Giraffe locked eyes with cherubs, understood why he locked eyes with a cherub, and readied himself for the daily trip. To banana tree. For the first time, Israel allowed himself to look his beauty straight in her face. I hope he, he stumbled a child now, as the spiritual within them was about to be gifted physical. So on knees with new proposals, he drew yes from Ishmatar's easy smile. With bent head, Israel's eyes filled wet with oceans, the red able to gift life as well as the Baltic and found universes in Ishmatar's iris. He then finished, I hope the babe is a girl. Ishmatar snuggled into lover for century, for ages, for time before time and after took finger, drew heart of scripture around her navel, as all the wild and untamed listened from there to here, to now, tomorrow. As Ismatar smiled, said then, it shall be so. <laughs> Beautiful, bravo. <laughs> Larry Jaffe. He was the state of Florida B Poet Laureate from 2018 to 2020. Hi, Larry. Great to be here. Hello, everybody. I can't hear anything but me. All right, so I'm going to read a selection of my work that's part of a tribute to Malcolm X. It's an anthology forthcoming that I was asked to participate in. First poem is called Meeting Malcolm X. While reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, I fell asleep to his dreams. When I awoke, Malcolm's fingerprints were set in mine. I had purpose, fresh from high school, I marched with Malcolm through his words. He took a nice Jewish boy from the Bronx and turned him into a soul. The next piece is called Soul Free. I am not a slave. I do not need to be freed to be free. No one can own a soul. I am not a slave. Why should I be shackled to the name of my keepers? I am not a slave. I cannot be owned, rented, or leased. I am not goods or chattel. I am not a slave. I will not be pigeonholed or stereotyped by Hollywood or my own fears. I am not a slave. I will challenge my tears pledge allegiance to the people for which I stand. No one can own a soul that knows it is free. The next piece is called Love Supreme. It took Coltrane to help me understand Malcolm. I put Coltrane's horn between my ears and he riddles them with exclamation points. Train twists my insides until I see outsides. Crying out with pain and humiliation, 
Coltrane exhausts my mind, satisfies the soul. Malcolm X repeats the refrain. His voice melodious, filled with passion and intelligence, making points, castigating impression and all its hidden forms. This was Malcolm X, a man accused of separatism and egotism. I dug deeper, found a man who moved mountains of human rights with unity and dignity for all peoples. I don't think we understood Malcolm. We listened to the leaves and, not did, and did not embrace the tree. Before his Hajj, Malcolm only saw black. After his pilgrimage, he did not see color, only humanity. The next piece is called Racial Indigate. We'll give you that again. Racial Indigestion. They sat on velvet thrones, these modern day St. Peter's, holding court at the Basilica of America, processing my relatives in the grand arcade of Ellis Island. Changing my people's names to eliminate their history and signatures of disapproval. They sought our strengths and wanted our wealth, but not our dignity or birthright. There could be no culture clashing colors to meld with the principles of American democracy in a homogenized society where my ancestors were processed white. My great grandmother Pesci was suddenly inscribed as Pauline. How nice that sounded. Without the times and tinges of the ghetto, she escaped, leaving her heritage to wake up in America with a new solid identity. All the world is this Western European stage processing my ancestors and bleeding our past into their gene pool and their record books. It gives me racial indigestion to wonder where my ancestors have gone. It gives me racial indigestion as these words bleed from eye sockets clogged with tears, from eyes blinded with rage, and these anthems that weave lies into stars and stripes. When my turn came, I skipped my heritage long lost in the Isles of Ellis Island. My Hebrew and Yiddish yearnings withered. I became a wandering Jew destined to be a cliche until one morning, tears still scoffing dreams. I looked into the long dead great grandmother's eyes that were reflected in this mirror as I searched even deeper to find my own. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Larry. Uh, yes, we'll we'll go to thank you, Gabby. Michael. Hi there, everybody. This is a shout out to Debbie and Paul and Krista and all you beat laureates. We're all celebrating uh National Poetry Month, and uh, thank you for doing this, and and hope you're all doing well over there in the states or wherever you might be. And to all you beatific people out there who are tuning in, uh, cheers! Here's a little ditty for you from Paris, France. I'm Michael Amiton, Michael D. Amiton. <laughs> The Georgia governor is bad and rotten. Look away, look away, look away in Dixieland. Well, in Dixieland, oh, I was born there early in one frosty morning. Look away, look away, look away in Dixieland. Well, I wish I was in Dixie. In Dixieland, I take my stand for the poor, the crying Dixie, away, away, away down. 
myself in Dixie away, away, away down south in Dixie. That's all, folks. Thank you, Michael. This might be the end of our program.